Well, welcome. This morning, we are gathered here to commemorate and celebrate the life of William Claire Knudsen, who is known to most of us as Bill Knudsen. Bill was a, was a husband, a father, a brother, a grandfather, a great-grandfather. Bill was also a scientist, a physicist in particular. He was a musician. He loved to sing, play the violin. He was a friend. He was a colleague. And above all else, he was an, ex he was an exemplary human being. Bill lived a long productive life and he will be sorely missed by all those who knew him well and and spent time with him and loved him and worked with him i'd especially like to recognize at this time the um presence of his of his beloved of his beloved wife of nearly 74 years she's here with us uh ruth crandall knudsen sitting right here in the front the service for Bill will go as, as outlined in the program. The invocation will be offered by, by his grandson, Yoke Kokonen, and this will be followed by the entire assembly singing, I Know That My Redeemer Lives, which is, is number 136 in the hymn book. And a short introduction to the song will be given by his oldest daughter, Linda Maddox. And the eulogy will then be given by youngest son, Grant Knudsen. Ruth Ann Kokonen, um, one of his daughters, will be then lead us in the song, How Great Thou Art, and we'll proceed from there. Okay. Our Father in heaven, we come before thee this day in remembrance of one of thy children, uh, William Knudsen, whom we all miss, love, and remember fondly. As we proceed today, please help us remember the good that we found in him, that we find in ourselves and in each other. As we reflect on his life, on our lives, and all of our mortality, please help us to renew or revisit and reflect on our relationships that we may find renewal in them Please help us to comfort those who are left behind, who are closest to him. We say these things in the name of Jesus Christ, amen. Just a little introduction to um, the song, I Know That My Redeemer Lives. Um, Mom and Dad lived with me in St. George, and we were in a senior ward. 
um, it, it was 55 plus. And um, can you all hear me, hopefully? <clears throat> but anyway, a little bit about the ward was a very interesting ward. Dad loved to go, and he would make sure that he got to the very middle. He would sit in the very middle where there would be headphones, and he would plug into those headphones. We had a lot of um, people that were um, patriarchs, ex-70s, um, a um, lot of stake presidents in our ward, and he just loved that ward. And one particular fast Sunday, which was, um, uh, it was a beautiful day, and Dad walked up to the podium, and he turned to the bishop, and he said, I would like to bear my testimony through song. And so he... Um, sang a cappello without any music, all the words to my Redeemer lives. And it was his testimony. And uh, it was a very spiritual thing, very dear to him. I don't know if Mother remembers that, but it was a wonderful, a wonderful thing. Very unusual, but very beautiful. So.
This isn't a good start. I'm already starting to get emotional. I'd like to welcome you all out here in, in celebration of my dad. And, and I hope that we can have a good discussion about my dad's life. I didn't mean it to be so emotional. <laughs> Hopefully I can pull it together here. Um, it's kind of interesting that I'm the one <laughs> doing this because um, my family might remember that, and my dad liked to tell me about this, that <laughs> at our dinners, I would tell jokes and stories and laugh <laughs> at them. And uh, I was the only one laughing because it, it didn't make sense to anybody else. So hopefully I can make sense today. Uh, anyway, uh, I decided not to, uh, you know, everybody's got the obituary, so you can read about the particulars of dad's life, but I wanted to share some things that meant something to me and my family. And so I thought I'd start out talking about dad's early life. Uh, he was, excuse me, he was early on, people called him Billy, family called him Billy, Bud, or Buddy, and uh, a teacher one time asked Grandma, why does, it, it, she asked if he was deaf, because he wouldn't respond to William, so early on he had to had those experiences and then um, he finally had a teacher that asked him hey wouldn't you like to be called Bill and so um, he liked this teacher a lot said he could he could have kissed her right then and there so from then on he he settled on the name Bill so that's all what what we all know what dad as is Bill Knutson uh, Early on, he had a, a interesting experience at school. He was bored, so he uh, he saw a fly land on his desk, and uh, he he slowly moved his mouth down with as it was, his mouth was open, and he he captured the fly with his mouth, and the and the teacher said, "Bill, what do you got in your mouth?" And he opened his mouth, and the fly came right out. <laughs> Dad loved building airplanes, and he found the most joy in, uh, in the building, not so much in the flying. He, he liked the process of building things early on. And he had a lot of interest in electronics, and especially he, he wanted to a radio in the worst way. So grandma traded in one of their old jackets to a, a relative and he was able to get a radio and get it working. Um, early, early on in junior high school, dad started having a lot of interest in math and science. He was also very musical. We'll talk more about that later. He was in the orchestra and the glee club. And dad, of course, played the violin. And I'll talk more about that later, too. He was in a quartet, and he sang in the choirs in high school. And he excelled in all subjects, except he, he, he says he didn't do too good in English. But he later on, 
work, worked hard at that to get better at that. Um, Dad's directing and solo singing started in high school where he directed a choir and sang a solo. And uh, early on, Dad admittedly wasn't very good socially with the girls. He actually had two girls ask him separately, you know, at separate times, of course, if he'd, if he'd like to be their boyfriend. And uh, he said, yeah. <laughs> and uh, he couldn't understand why he couldn't, uh, you know, one of the girls went to a dance with somebody else. He couldn't understand that. But uh, it was probably because dad couldn't spend any time with him. He was so busy with all this other stuff. So anyway, something interesting about dad. Uh, of course, dad, dad is a vet, veteran of World War II, and he was in um, the Pacific Theater. He'd always tell me why he joined the Army instead of the Air Force or the Navy. He said that uh, he didn't want to fly or be in a boat, It'd make him sick, seasick. Um, and Dad's smarts in, the radio, in radio and electronics got him into the Signal Corps officer's training. And he was uh, just out of high school and he was in there with uh, much older men. And uh, that helped him later on, definitely, to basically stay alive. Uh, and we'll talk about that. Uh, just a few things I remember Dad talking about in the military. Uh, just maybe relates to Dad's love of work and working hard and doing things the right way. He talked about when he was in basic training that they'd be sent somewhere with a bunch of enlisted men and told to, to dig a ditch or dig a hole. And of course, all the other guys sat there and didn't do anything because they said, hey, they're, what are you doing, Knuts? And you know, uh, they just sent us out here to get out of the way, basically. But Dad said, hey, they sent us out here to do, do a job, and we're going to do it. So he, he sort of sh showed the example of how to work. Um, and so I, I kind of mentioned that I think we're all here, a uh, family of, of dads, because he, had, he was um, really good at what he did in the, in the military with the radio. He set up telephone lines and whatnot, um, but if he hadn't been so good at that, there's a lot of peop um, men that were losing their lives quite fast on Okinawa. He was on Okinawa, and uh, if if they weren't busy doing that, he probably would have had to go uh, into some dangerous areas. So anyway. And Dad also, uh, uh, the church became very important to him in the military. Excuse me. Uh, he said he gained the testimony of the scriptures and the gospel while he was in the military. And uh, he also would do things like trade shifts with other people on the mil in the, on the tele people that worked on the telephone line so that he could attend church on Sunday and he'd take the uh, less desirable shifts so and of course dad had um, a great professional wife uh, as mentioned in the obituary dad had an early aptitude for math and seemed to want to figure out how things worked. This must have been one of the characteristics that led him to pursue a career in space research. He spent a lifetime pondering the workings of various aspects of, of the universe. 
he felt like it was a calling that he had and perhaps even a gift from his Heavenly Father. There were times he felt that he had been given spiritual guidance in his research, especially when something was proving difficult to solve. Dad was proud of his accomplishments, such as the success of his instrument on Pioneer Venus, but he wasn't boastful. He appreciated recognition of his hard work, but he didn't seek it. I watched Dad, and he was a great example for me of uh, work. He had over a year of sick leave that he never used. He, I never remember Dad being homesick, maybe once or twice. He just loved his work. Um, I was fortunate to be able to go down to Cape Canaveral and watch the uh, Pioneer Venus uh, take off from, Cape, from the Cape. It was an exciting time. Dad also had a lot of respect from the, his colleagues at work. I was able to, to be an in, um, have an internship at Lockheed where he was. And uh, we, I talked a lot with some of the coworkers that he had, and uh, they had a lot of respect for Dad. Some of the things I remember uh, about Dad, some of his, his interests, His dad never, in his early days, he did never, I don't remember him watching TV. You know, um, he had better things to do, I guess, which is good. And he, everybody that knows dad lo knows he loved music. He grew up in a musical family. And people often heard people singing from the Knudsen Hall in the neighborhood there in Provo. In fact, uh, his dad influenced him a lot, saying, hey, because there was a time where dad had a chance to play, you know, his coach was trying, or coaches were trying to get him to play basketball or football even. And uh, his dad, grandpa, didn't, sort of discouraged him so he wouldn't uh, hurt his fingers to play, you know, so he could play violin. My sister, Ruth Ann, said that the, he involved us in some singing. She said that we did do, do re mi like the Von Trapp family at a church event. Was I in that? I don't even know. It must have been pearly, pretty early on. Um, he involved us in other ways. We had to go around the neighborhood and, and uh, sing carols with his, he'd play the violin. And I'd try to hide as best I could. Um, a lot of people that know Dad from church know about his involvement as a director. If you remember how Sunday school used to be, they'd have practice hymns. And Dad wanted to make sure that everybody did it right. And we had to do it over and over again. He'd stop in the middle of the song. And then even more embarrassing, he'd pick me out of the crowd <laughs> and say, Grant, find yourself a hymn. Get going here. Uh, how am I doing on time? <laughs> okay. Dad loved gardening, too, and he was a good gardener. Mom would have dinner right at 5 o'clock sharp. <laughs> and if you weren't there, it was going to be heated up. <laughs> and so if Dad had some time, he'd go get, you know, change clothes, and he'd go right up to the garden. Um... Dad was good at home projects, too, and uh, 
we had a home built in uh, Monticerino, California. And Dad did a lot of the work there. And which kind of amazed me, all the things he did, because, you know, I, I do everything by YouTube. <laughs> That's how I learn. But I don't know how Dad would have done it. He just had that knowledge, which is good. And, of course, Dad um, was able to travel a lot from his, because of his work. And uh, him and Mom went to a lot of countries throughout the world traveling, so I'm sure that was fun for Dad and Mom. As far as religion, my dad practiced what he preached. I was... Uh, I was his home teaching companion. Dad cared for people. I remember one, one person we home taught worked at a gas station. And the only time we could get together was at the gas, you know, he'd have a take a break from the gas station and come over. And I, I thought, oh, what a waste of time. <laughs> but I think it honestly helped the people that he took the time to pay attention to and showed that he cared. And, uh, I think we had a great family life. Dad had a, a great and interesting parenting style. <laughs> um, Guy and I used to get into a few arguments and fights. And uh, Dad bought a pair of boxing gloves for both of us. <laughs> and. Uh, We'd duke it out in the garage with my dad uh, uh, refereeing. <laughs> he also had us do some pretty interesting things as far as arguing. He'd have us argue with a wall. <laughs> yeah, that's true. And uh, if you slammed a door, you had to open and close it softly a hundred times. I did this to my kids too, so they know. He also talked, this was a famous one, you know, if a frog jumped up and, and said the moon was made of green cheese, would you argue with it? That was a big one of his. He also had a lot of logic to some of the things he did. I, I was deathly afraid of the dark when I was growing up. I'd, Take the covers over my head and hide. And uh, Dad would get me up and uh, get me with a flashlight and, you know, look in every corner of the room and in the closet so that I could tell that there were no boogeymen. He also taught me a lesson about being appreciative of what we get. I remember particularly a time when he, I got... I don't know if it was a birthday or Christmas. I wanted a pair of skates so badly because we used to skate out in front a lot. And uh, I wanted a black pair of skates, not white. <laughs> and Dad got me a white pair of roller skates. And I just went up to Dad and I said, I don't, I don't want these, thinking he was going to get me a black pair of skates. Well, no skates were coming. So I learned the lesson the hard way. <laughs> Be appreciative of what you get. And like I said before, Dad was in the, in the work. That was our thing. And um, I remember having a list <laughs> of chores and uh, going up to Dad and saying, and complaining about having a list of chores. And he'd give me another chore. <laughs> That's just his style. So I learned pretty quick, don't complain about it. 
the chores you get. Um, some of the other activities that we had that, I, that come to mind for me. When we'd go to bed, he'd do wheelbarrows. And at least you, Guy and I, I don't know, remember, remember about you kids. Okay, good. We used to, wheel, he'd wheelbarrow us down to our rooms for the night. The other thing is, Dad was really in the Halloween, and he, uh, he built a scarecrow, and he put a speaker in it. And he'd be in the house with the microphone, talking to the little kitties as they coming up, and just, would you scratch my back? Things like that. And, um, you know, and be so kind to those kids. And I'd want to grab the mic and you know, yell at them, scare them or something, you know. But no, Dad was so nice to those kids. Um, yeah, I also remember we, a tradition of ours was going and cutting down Christmas trees. Uh, well, a Christmas tree. <laughs> Uh, that was always a fun and exciting thing for our family. Um, he'd take Guy and I fishing. We really enjoyed that. Some camping trips as a family. I, I specifically remember trips to Yellowstone and um, Yosemite. And he'd take us to the beach, and uh, we'd go out for, uh, occasionally we'd go out to a restaurant. I remember those good times. Here's some of my personal uh, memories of Dad. It means a lot to me. He saved my life one time, uh, literally. We were driving in the old station wagon, and somehow... <laughs> I had opened the door and I went flying out on the door <laughs> as we're turning the corner. And Dad was able to grab me from the driver's seat and uh, yank me back in. Um, I also remember trips he'd take us to take me to the hardware store to check the old. Uh, tube technology transistors and stuff like that, for those of you that might remember that. One thing that stands out is, you know, you don't, you don't win every time. Dad had this experiment. He was just so, you know, he was really working on it. He built a, a tank and this instrument, and I think it had something to do with uh, helping with oil e exploration. And uh, I thought, hey, this is pretty cool. Dad, can I go get the neighbors? So I got all my neighbor friends, and we came over to watch Dad do his experiment. <laughs> and it was pretty anticlimactic because it was just a little bubble <laughs> that came out of this thing. And, but, you know, I just thought that was, you know, Dad was trying there. He had a lot of good ideas. He, one of his ideas was an intermittent, an intermittent um, wiper, you know, that we all have on our cars now. That was before the time that they had that. Uh, another thing that stands out is Dad would, uh, I was, you know, I don't remember if I was in high school, but I threw pretty hard. I was, I was a pitcher. And uh, Dad bought a catcher's mitt and uh, decided to try to catch me. <laughs> I said, are you sure, Dad? <laughs> yeah, yeah, I'll, get, I'll do it. I'll be all right. And uh, I remember I hit his foot really bad. <laughs> And I thought, oh my gosh, an example of going the extra mile. One thing that also stands out in baseball was dad was my very first home run. Dad was there to call it. He was an umpire. And uh, it was a judgment call because they had uh, cones out there. 
And, I, and the other coach went out there to argue with Dad, but Dad said, nope, that was a home run. <laughs> and then also the Pinewood Derby. And I think Dad was way more into it than I was. <laughs> he, he'd sit there and, hey, no, no, we needed to put some graphite on that. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, I, I did win, but I, I feel a little bad about that. That uh, you know, we didn't. You know, a little disclaimer. <laughs> My dad mostly did this. <laughs> uh, I some of the things that talk about how dad was caring. Um, we took several people into our homes, our home, that needed help at the time. And my parents, to their credit, were willing to take them in to our, our home. And that's not always easy. And finally, I, I think Dad loved his children. He made us feel secure and safe. He helped us financially in other ways and opened his home to children, grandchildren, and all our friends. I don't ever remember bringing a friend over that dad didn't make him feel wanted and welcome. Another thing that impressed me is I don't ever remember remember Dad gossiping or back, you know, trashing somebody behind their back, and that was a real example to me. And I don't I don't really ever remember Dad saying he loved me a lot, but I knew it. I knew that he loved me. And especially, I don't remember Dad had ever discouraging me from trying something so that I wouldn't be afraid to try something if I didn't succeed. I was allowed to make mistakes. And I'll be forever grateful to Dad for supporting me so that I could have the success that I have had in this life. And I'll always be grateful, Dad. And I love you, Dad. And I miss you. Excuse me. Thank you. If everyone can turn to page 86, or number 86 in the hymnal, this was one of my dad's favorite songs, and he used to sing this as a solo quite often in church. And uh, last year, when he and mother were discussing what they would like at their funeral service, he asked me if I would sing this song And I wasn't overly excited because I thought, how can you ask me to sing a song when I'm uh, grieving? <laughs> Have you ever tried to sing when you're grieving and crying? And well, Anyway, I'm going to do it for my dad and for my mom. And I think I will just do the first and the last verse. <laughs> and if I really struggle, please join me to support dad in this lovely song that he felt so strongly about. And I just want you to know that this wand, this director's wand that I'm using today was my father's. And he used to direct music a lot. So I just, it means a lot to our family. I'll just leave it right here. I'm gonna step away.
Thank you, Mom. And thanks, Grant, for that lovely eulogy. I, too, was one of <coughs> Grandpa's home teaching companions <laughs> on a number of occasions. And I did it begrudgingly, but I really appreciate the effort he made and the care he had towards others. And he really showed it. At this point in the service, um, I'd like to take about 15 to 20 minutes around there for any, any of the grandchildren of Bill to come up and share a memory or experience or some thoughts if they would like to. Um, I think you mentioned, was there? Um, Thanks. Um, I guess I'll take a first crack at it so I can, the canvas is open for me. But I'll go ahead and, I think I'm a, I have a lot of memories, but I think I'd just like to focus on some of the more recent ones um, that are, I guess, a little more, a little more personal. Um, when he was towards the end of his stay up in Alpine, they lived in Alpine for roughly 20 years, uh, and I knew, I knew they were going to be leaving soon. I, I, you know, I knew Grandpa was a veteran of World War II, and I, I like history, so I, you know, I know all the historical events of World War II, and well, not all of them, but I, I know about it, and I know what happened, and and I, I had known about his role and what he did, and and whatnot, but I wanted to hear it from his mouth. I wanted to hear his experience, and, and I had never asked him before about World War II. I, I don't know why, I just, I just think that I, just, I, I knew about it, and I just never really talked to him about it. So I, we were in his, I guess it was his bedroom, his little area where he has a TV, and we were, I, we were watching a football game or something, and I brought it up, and he started, he, we just started talking about it, and he told me about his, his boat ride over to Honolulu and then to the Philippines, and it's funny you mentioned he gets seasick. <laughs> I think he was talking about that. And um, being in the Philippines and then Okinawa, and, and it was just, it was, I just felt, I was really grateful for the opportunity I had to, to hear a veteran of World War II, you know, one of the greatest historical moments ever. I, be able to tell me with his own mouth what he experienced, and it sat it saddens me to to know that we're at that point where we we don't where World War II veterans are passing on, and we're not going to have that ability to hear this from them anymore. We're not going to be able to hear it directly from them. We have all the history, but we can't talk to them about it. And I was really grateful for that. And one more thing I wanted to just bring up was um, last month in June, I came up here with my two daughters from Arizona, and we were we were just up here for just to visit people, and and we took an afternoon to go visit Grandma and Grandpa, and and I remember I when as we were leaving, I told Grandpa, I, you know, I just I just had the distinct feeling, the impression that I should. I let him know how much I loved him. So I, I just, as we were leaving, I, I gave him a big hug, and I just looked him right in the eyes, and I said, I love you, Grandpa. I love you. And at that moment, I wanted him to know that. And I know we don't always get to say those things to someone we love as the, as the, last, as the last thing we can say. And I'm just so... Grateful. I was able to, to say that to him, and I hope he knows that. I hope he <laughs> he can hear us saying this, and and I'm thankful for him. Time's yours. <laughs> Um, 
not normally a crier. <gasps> Sorry. I should have written this all down because I'm not good at scattered thoughts and making sense of what's in my head without reading it. Um, but every time I attempt it, I would just start crying. So, sorry, you're going to have to just hear a mumble, a jumble of random thoughts about my grandfather. Um, an apology because I, uh, I've known of people who have died, but Grandpa is actually the first person I know who has died. And so I'm not sure how to handle this. So forgive me if I just start sobbing in the middle of everything. Um, first of all, I brought a picture. I don't know if you can see it. This is, I was probably six, seven, eight. This was in Hawaii when we lived there and Grandpa was visiting. And he, will, he was wheelbarrowing me to bed. <laughs> so he continued that tradition with his grandkids. And that was a fond memory of mine. I remember... <laughs> Um, we would pretend to get flat tires so that he could come around and pump us back up. <laughs> and we tried to do it as many times as possible, and I think he got tired of it. <laughs> um, I remember when we went and visited him in California, he would always be out in his garden, and uh, he'd try and get us to come do some work for him, and he would offer to pay us a penny per weed. <laughs> And I remember we did it for a little bit, but realized that it was slave labor. <laughs> um, some of the favorite sayings that he used to say to us, um, very similar to what Grant said, but it was a little different. I remember him saying, if a frog jumped up and called you whatever, stupid, ugly, you know, would you believe him? <laughs> um, so it was, you know, whenever our siblings would argue or something and call each other something, and he would say, well, if a frog jumped up and called you that, would you believe him? Anyway. Um, he also liked, if one of us called something or somebody stupid, he would say, how can it be stupid if it doesn't have a brain? I remember that really confusing me when I was really little, <laughs> thinking, it is stupid because it doesn't have a brain. Um, when he used to visit us in Hawaii, and this is a very little thing probably to anybody else, but it meant a lot to me, he would go swimming with me. Um, for those of you who know me now, swimming is my life. I still swim every day. I coach swim teams, and swimming is a very big part of my day. And it meant the world to me that he would go swimming. Um, it was in the ocean. Sometimes he'd go to the BYU-Hawaii pool. But he would spend that time with me. And I know that he probably didn't care about swimming, but that was his way of reaching out to me. So I always appreciated that. Um, after, well, during college, I spent almost every weekend at Grandma and Grandpa's house. They were kind of my safe haven. College was kind of rough for me. And I didn't know how to spend my weekends, and so I would go up to Grandma and Grandpa's house and I would spend my whole weekend there with them. And so they were my, my rock during that time. And shortly after my mission, I was kind of in a just situation where I was trying to figure out what to do with my life. I was applying for graduate schools and studying for graduate um, entrance exams and just decided to stop at my grandparents' house for a brief time, and it ended up being about nine months. And it was because of my grandpa. Um, one day, he just decided... He said to me, I have a really strong feeling that I need to take you across the street and introduce you to my neighbor. And this neighbor was building a house. And um, I don't know what, why my grandpa thought that at the time, um, but I just went along with it. Sure, grandpa, let's go. <laughs> um, but it turns out this um, neighbor was in search of a house painter. And I had painted houses all through college, and so my grandpa, through the series of conversations that we had, I ended up painting houses for, or painting this man's house and living with my grandparents. And it was during this time that I met my husband. So it kind of altered the course of my life. I never would have stayed with my grandparents for that long if my grandpa hadn't found that job for me. And I never would have met my husband. Um, 
And so I have a lot to thank my grandpa for. Lots of little memories and lots of big life-altering changes in my life because of grandpa. And so I'm appreciative of everything he did. And I was able to visit grandma and grandpa on Mother's Day, and that was the last time I saw grandpa. And one of the last things he said to me, well, asked me was, are you going to be at my funeral? <laughs> no. I think every time I've seen him, he's asked me that in the last couple of years. And every time, yes, Grandpa, I'll be there. So, Grandpa, I am here. I, I made sure that I was here. And I miss you and I love you. Just a quick little note, I'm the oldest. And so I remember dad a little bit different than Grant. And, uh, and uh, <clears throat> I remember my dad spending very, very much time in his research as a kid. I don't remember playing that much or whatever. I mean, he was a good father. I'm not trying to say anything bad about that. He was a good father. The one thing that I would like to share with you that I think is a real important thing is he was an extremely humble man. I remember I was probably in my early 20s <clears throat> when my father all of a sudden started having all these people from other countries coming and staying with us. And I had no idea why. Um, and uh, I just didn't even think of asking him for some reason. I mean, he just always was doing his work, and that was, I just accepted that. Um, but one time I remember in particular, one of his, com uh, the people that work he worked with on his instrument was a man that was from Germany. His name was Carl Spinner. And he had come to our home and um, he had asked me if I'd like to take him for a hike in the uh, Redwoods, which we lived very close to. And uh, so I uh, said, yeah, I'll, t I'll take you for a hike. I didn't even, I did not know this man at all, really. And I thought, I'll just, I'll be glad to do that. And... Um, as we started walking up into the foothills, he turned to me and looked at me and he said, how does it feel to be the daughter of the most famous scientist in the world? I turned and looked at him and I thought, my dad? I did not have any idea that he was who he was and what he was doing. Dad did not go into that. He was a very humble man. I know that he told me that whenever he had a question about something, that he would go to the Lord first and ask the Lord if what he was doing at the time, if it was the right path, the right correct, if it was correct, the thing that he was looking or studying about. And he would receive an answer. But 
But I, mostly what I want to say is, from my perspective as, as the oldest child, he never talked about those things. He was a father first. He took care of me. As a, as a young child, I remember being sick quite often. And uh, he'd take me to the hospital. He'd take me to the hospital. And he was, he was always so good to me. But mostly, he never expected a thanks or great honors or anything of that nature. His work was his work. And I think he considered it a calling from Heavenly Father. And uh, so just it, just a, as a perspective as the oldest daughter, that was the one thing I... He went, we went for a walk up into the mountains one time, my father and I, alone. And I was concerned about what the earth would be like or what heaven would be like. And I asked him, I said, what is, is the world going to look like the Urim and Thummim? And at the time I thought of this ball, glass ball. And I said, are we going to be living on a glass ball? No trees, no nothing. There's just a glass ball. And he said, well, I, I don't know, but that's what it says in the scriptures, that it will be a Urim and Thummim. And um, there were a few other great things that at that time he talked to me and told me about his testimony and about what he felt the earth would be like after this lifetime. But I wanted to share that experience that he was a great humble man. He never told us about what he, at least me, I don't know about Ruth Ann's nodding her head. I don't know about Grant. Grant was involved more. He was he was more involved with, during the time that my dad was doing his scientific research. I was dating and I met Frank and I don't remember where Guy was at the time. I, I was probably pretty old at the time, than, uh, older than my siblings. But uh, like I said, the greatest thing that I remember about my father is his humility. He loved people. He was... He never bragged about his what he was doing, and that was important to him. I just wanted to let you know that that was a redeeming um, quality that he had. Thank you. We're going to proceed and <clears throat> have a closing musical number, which will be a violin solo by by Dana Knudsen. And she will be playing on Grant Bill's violin, correct? Okay. And then Julia Iverson will be giving the benediction. I just want to say really quickly, um, I'm, I asked my sister Leanne to sing along with me on the second verse. Um, and I just wanted to say really quickly, this is my grandfather's violin. Um, and it's very special to me. Um, I know that he, he gave it to me. Um, he gave it to me quite a few years ago and and I, I feel like it was a sacrifice for him because he didn't have it anymore. He gave it to me and I feel really grateful really grateful for it and it's always gonna remind me of him.
So just wanted to say that. I don't sing very often in front of people because I get extremely nervous, so I'll try to channel my grandfather's boisterous voice. <laughs> I'm not like a talented musician or anything, but I'm honored that I can sing last minute with Dana. And um, I guess I'll share one quick memory while she's finishing setting up. Um, I, I took some piano lessons growing up and um, we would come down from Washington State where we lived and I would practice the piano and I wasn't very great at it and grandpa would come in and he would do this part again um, <laughs> and so I really appreciate that he's so musically inclined and um, um, yeah and I I'll share one last little thing I feel kind of impressed to share um, I didn't have the closest connection with my grandfather. Um, when he passed away, um, I've been going through a lot of health things for many years, and I had kind of withdrawn from the family somewhat um, for fear of being misunderstood, and I felt I had been taking a nap when he passed away. I had no clue, and I was woken up out of my sleep. And I felt him tell me that he was proud of me and that he knew me now. And so if there's anyone else who has, you know, um, you know, maybe not, like, the strongest connection with their loved ones, I just want you to know that, like, I have faith that when we pass, we understand each other better. Um, and yeah, I just felt impressed to share that. So we'll see how this goes. <laughs> but Our dear Father in Heaven, we um, are grateful that we can be together here as family and as friends and to um, remember and be grateful for the life of our father and grandfather and friend and, and part of our family 
um, William Knudsen, and we um, pray that we can have peace as we go through this day and that uh, throughout our lives as we remember um, the, his example and his influence that he has had on our lives and that we can all um, learn from that. We're grateful for uh, thy gospel and for um, and for the plan of salvation and that we know that this is not the end, that we can be with him and and that he will be part of us, part of our family again, and that we can um, grow close again. We pray that we might be uh, safe as we go throughout the rest of our day and that we can uh, continue to grow in our friendships and relationships with one another. And we pray that we can remember that that is what we take with us and how important that is. And we say this in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen.